He is risen indeed. Good morning. Happy Easter to each of you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. On this most joyful day of the year, we celebrate the risen Lord. Will you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as Karen read the scripture, you'll notice that it was early in the morning, but not just early, but very early that a group of women go down to the tomb. Now, I know from the turnout at our sunrise service that pilgrims are not often very early. <laughs> <laughs> but we did have a few hearty souls there, and they, uh, I think they appreciate it. Uh, but these group of women go down to the tomb with spices that they had prepared to anoint Jesus's body. And they had been waiting for the first light after the Sabbath so they could go down to the grave and do this one good last thing for their Lord. So when they get there, they find that the, the big stone has already been rolled away. And so they enter the tomb and maybe they're more confused than anything. It's, it's kind of strange. They must have been thinking because they'd seen that the stone had sealed the tomb a couple days earlier. And the women had seen the body and how it was laid in the tomb. So if these things weren't strange enough, our scripture tells us that two men in dazzling white robes appear out of nowhere. And they're not there to answer any questions. They're there to ask questions. Why have you come here? They asked the women. And more importantly, for our purposes this morning, why do you seek the living among the dead? The one who was crucified, dead, and buried in this tomb, he is risen. Remember what he told you, the two men seem to be trying to jog these women's uh, memories. Remember, it was back in Galilee. And we can imagine that the reality slowly dawns on them. Yes, he did say he would be crucified, die, and rise again on the third day. You can picture Joanna and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and some of the other women who are not named, talking among themselves. Maybe they think. Okay, maybe what he said was true. Maybe they were the ones who dismissed it as an idle tale. And I'm not sure they could take it in right away, this news he has risen. Sometimes in my life, I know that I kind of learn more about what I believe and what I understand by telling the story to somebody else. And I think that's what the women were doing that morning. They rushed back to the disciples to tell them what had happened. So they get back to this large group. It's probably mostly men. It's the, the 11 and some others gathered with them. And they are met with skepticism. Hmm. We are told the women's story seemed to the, the disciples to be an idle tale. But we have to ask ourselves, would we have believed the women? Sometimes it seems like it's human nature to despair. The condition of the world can seem very grim, especially in these last couple of years. And I think we've all been trained by the school of life to expect bad news. And while there are both optimists and pessimists among us, I believe the pessimists prefer to be called realists. And we can suppose that the stories of the women might have helped, 
less weight with the men, but I'm not 100% sure of this. That's a feminist reading of the scripture. I think that women in the Jesus community might have been seen as equals. And these women had been with the men from the beginning, and one of them is someone's mother. So James might listen to his own mother. I think what we're seeing in the disciples' reception of the women is despair and fear with all the loss and brutality they had witnessed, the crucifixion of their leader between two common thieves, his burial in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The disciples were traumatized. Traumatization is a big word these days. We say it a lot. They were traumatized. They were not expecting this good news. And they did not believe what Jesus had said was going to happen, would happen. They were not expecting that Jesus would rise again, that he would conquer death once and for all, that he would show us that death is not the end, that love wins, that life is stronger than death. Yeah. Not after what they had seen in witness. But then, then it dawns on Peter, and I love this about Peter. Maybe what the women said is true. And this is the real turning point of the story. Maybe I ought to go check this out for myself, Peter thinks. So Peter runs down to the tomb. He sees the burial cloths discarded. And then Peter is amazed. And he wonders about what happened. Something has changed in Peter. He's gone from dismissing the women to considering their story. He's gone from closed and convinced of his own truth to maybe a bit open-minded and curious. Curious enough to run over to the tomb. At each encounter, the women with the two men at the tomb, the group of women with the disciples, Peter at the tomb alone, there is an opportunity in the story. And this is an opportunity for light and space, chance to let go of fixed and rigid notions of what is possible and what is not possible. In each instance, there's a hint, a possibility, an opening to a truth that is both unexpected and beautiful. What if the ultimate truth is that there is no death, only transformation? What if life is eternal? What if there is nothing to fear because no one is truly lost? How would that truth transform you? This morning, Easter is an invitation to see life in an entirely different way. It makes me think of what the fox tells the little prince in that famous story that you can only see clearly with your heart the most important things, that which is essential is invisible to the eye. The Easter story invites us to let go of what is not eternal, our obsessions with material things, our perfectionism with ourselves, our perfectionism with others, the just right career, the well curated children, the showcase home. Arthur Brooks, who teaches sociology at Harvard, writes a column on happiness, wrote recently in the Atlantic about this dissatisfaction and striving that seems to be baked into our very DNA. Dissatisfaction drives us forward to achieve, but he tells us, these achievements rarely satisfy. We don't need someone from Harvard to tell us that. We know this from our own lives. The more we possess, the seems the more we want or think we need. 
but God asks us to step off this treadmill of desire and dissatisfaction. God wants us to be in relationship with God just as we are, just as we are. That's it. No change needed. God invites us to let go and just be and to step into the freedom that Christ's life, death, and resurrection gives us. Where the only rule, the only thing we have to keep in mind is that we need to love everyone. That's it. That's all you need. Now, some of you know that I lost my mother a few months ago. I don't know if my dad's here on Zoom, but he'll understand what I'm gonna say. My mom was an ambitious woman. She was an accomplished woman. She had started out with the dream of becoming the first woman secretary of state. This was before Madeleine Albright and Hillary got there. She ended up being the mother of six children, the wife of a naval officer carving out for herself a career helping military families and creating programs for them. She achieved a lifelong goal at the age of 60 when she received her PhD. She had a library full of books on every subject, but especially on sociology <coughs> and the dynamics of the family. The life of the mind was very important to my mom. She was a true intellectual. So when she began forgetting things, when dementia took hold of her, she lost the intellectual life she so treasured. Yet over the 17 years of her illness, a new life emerged in her. While she let go of the ability to follow the plot of a movie, or to read a menu, she gained a new life of being fully present in the moment. While she lost track of family milestones, she gained a new way of relating to and encouraging the people around her, greeting each person with warmth and a smile radiating kindness, even as she could not tell you what their name was or who they were in the world's terms. Until finally towards the end of her life, my mom became someone who fully embodied love and the light just shone from her eyes. It transformed life. And this kind of transformation is a sort of forerunner for the resurrection where we will all be changed, but still recognizably ourselves. <clears throat> where we enter into new life, a life where we let go of everything that is not essential. And as we lose, we gain. To say that Jesus is risen from the dead is not to say he has returned to his earthly life. His earthly life was over when he was crucified. He was transformed. To say that Jesus is risen from the dead is to say that God reached into that tomb and into history, lifting Jesus up to a new life. And it is to say that God will do the same thing for each and every one of us and for all our loved ones. And even at this moment, God is doing this for us. To be fully alive is the gift of this Easter morning. To live as if the story of the women is not an idle tale, but a transformative one. Recently, I encountered a 1974, I think it was 1974 poem by author, and I know you all probably know of Kentucky's most staunch defender of the environment, Wendell Berry. The poem is called 
manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front. <laughs> Some of you know it. It's a great title for a poem. It is an Easter poem. In it, Barry encourages us to come apart from our obsessions with wealth and status, to see those things for what they are, passing, temporary, and ultimately unsatisfying. While the world entices us with shiny things that have no long-term lasting value, Barry asks us to invest our time differently. He entreats us, spend your time following God, building strong communities of love and care, and remembering what matters. Barry concludes the poem saying that we should confound the powers that be, the generals and the politicos, of this world would set us on paths of destruction of self and others, seeking meaning where there is none. He reminds us that the resurrection is something subversive. It's something unexpected, not serving earthly expectations, not limited by the so-called rules, but liberating us to be fully alive. Be like the fox, he writes makes more tracks than necessary. Some in the wrong direction. <laughs> Practice resurrection. Practice resurrection. Show every day that you are a transformed person, that you have been set free, that the truth of an idle tale has saved you from a life of idol worship. Come and be among the living. Now, I want you all here to look around you right now. And if you're on Zoom, look into our space. Look at these pews, at the walls, at the floors. Maybe you look at the people next to you. When you return to worship with us, and I hope you do, on Pentecost June 5th this year, this space will be transformed. Now we know from biology and quantum physics uh, that life is always changing. Things are never exactly the same. Cells are renewing. Things are not as the eye sees them. But I want you to expect a big visible change next time you walk into the sanctuary. Amen. Thank you. I love these cheers. <laughs> now, I'm not expecting a resurrection miracle will be happening at Pilgrim, although there have been times when this church was mistaken for dead. <laughs> mistaken for dead. <laughs> we shall live. A lot of hard work on behalf of many of you has gone into planning the renewal of this space. But the real renewal is embodied in the people, the spirit of the living Christ here with us. And I believe she is alive and expressing herself in a whole new way, transforming us as a church, breathing love into everything we do, transforming a place where we come together to be God's hands and feet transforming us into a congregation that's fully alive. So I invite you to be on this journey with us. Let yourself emerge this day a changed person, transformed by the good news of Easter, the good news that love conquers death. This is good news for all those who suffer in the shadows. It's good news for the transgender youth, afraid to talk about himself to his teachers, and it's good news for the people of Ukraine who struggle under the torrent of missile strikes, the approach of tanks. And it's good news to the poor here in Chattanooga who camp out on 11th Street without permanent homes. And it's good news for you, and it's good news for me, my friends, believing in the possibilities, believing in transformation. This is really what sets us apart as Christians. So welcome the power of this good news to change and transform your life. And let us 
like that dear disciple Peter, lead this morning transformed by what we have seen and heard, full of wonder and amazement. Amen. Amen. <laughs>